This, this has been a wonderful conference, and uh, again, it was such an honor for me to be here and to learn from all of you. So thank you again for, for allowing me to become agilized, or whatever the right word would be. Um, this is really exciting for me to be able to lead this discussion with a couple of amazing people. I was going to say students, but we're now beyond that because you're part of the real world now. And it's really quite remarkable. I first met them seven years ago, and they were students at Shanti Bhavan. And now we have this wonderful proof of concept that a school can really change the entire dynamics of perhaps just a village, or perhaps an entire country, or perhaps the entire world. And in fact, it all starts with a vision. With a vision, as I said this morning, one person truly can change the world. It was one person who decided to create this school. And now there are people graduating year after year. And any one of these people are also now equipped to change the world. Yet, their background, their stories, where they came from, is different than the types of backgrounds that we think of when we talk about world leaders and we talk about change, agents of change. But what Shanti Bhavan is proving is that give any child an opportunity, a real opportunity, they can not just survive, they can thrive. And that's really what uh, Dr. George has created with this school, is an opportunity for Dalits to thrive, to break any concept of a glass ceiling for poverty. It is not acceptable to just look at the most impoverished people in the world and say, we just want to make them and help them survive. We can do better than that. And that's exactly what is being proven by this school and by Shilpa and Prem and the many other students who are now graduating. So thank you for joining me. And uh, I look forward to your sharing your words with this audience that wants to hear about your experience. And so I think the first thing that I want to talk about is this idea of that it's about thriving. So tell us a little bit, Shilpa, why don't you start? Tell us a little bit about where you are today, what your life is like, and what you're aiming to do at this point. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Ravi, thank you so much for inviting my friend Prem and I to this wonderful evening. Uh, in fact, just to, uh, before I start, I want to say something about Ravi. I met Ravi seven years ago, exactly seven years ago at Shanti Bhavan when I was in the midst of studying for my 12th grade board exams. And Ravi is one such person that you never forget him the mo moment you meet him. And I was just um, joking with him that probably our first encounter didn't go so well that he decided not to return to Shantipan for the next seven years. And I'm meeting him here today. So uh, Ravi, I'm very happy to share the stage with you today. I've never, um, it, when I was a student, like Ravi mentioned, the real world, we always, Prem and I wondered what the real world was because from the age of four, we. Uh, were raised and we were we studied in this residential school called Shanti Bhavan. So both of us joined at the age of four and we left when we were 17. So we grew up, I, it almost felt like a bubble, like this um, Shanti Bhavan was stuck, is this 30 acres of land, uh, the school um, the school rests on 30 acres of land tucked into the woods and our exposure to the real world was very limited. And um, so today, uh, it's been five years since I left there and left from Shantiban, and I've been a part of the real world. And with each challenge that comes my way, um, I'm happy that I don't give up or I don't buckle to the challenges. And I actually can say that I'm loving the real world. And um, but you know, you and I have something else in common now, is that we're both published authors. Shopa has a book. And, and it's ranking high on Amazon.com, so you must go and look at The Elephant Chaser's Daughter. 
I don't know how the ranking system works on Amazon. Every minute is changing. But um, I just want to show you my book. It's called The Elephant Chaser's Daughter. And it's the, I took seven years to work on it because uh, it being a memoir, it was not memo, uh, it was an out, it being um, a non fiction and the story of my life. It took me a lot of time to come to terms with everything that had happened. And it would probably would have taken me less time, lesser time if it was a fictional work that I was working on. But since it was something so personal to me, uh, it took a lot of time to reflect on it and uh, think about everything that had happened in the past that had come to shape my present. So it just got released in July and I'm very excited to share it with the world. And what was so remarkable too. Yeah, one more time, <laughs> absolutely. What I thought was so remarkable is when I, rem I remember Shilpa seven years ago, and the reason why she said maybe our first meeting didn't go that well is because uh, Shilpa had ambitions at that time and maybe still of being a journalist. And so she interviewed me. And she was a tough, tough interview. <laughs> and I remember that very well. And it's, it's one of my fond memories of being in Shanti Bhavan was being interviewed by this aspiring journalist who wasn't afraid to ask the difficult, tough questions. And I think it is no surprise to me that she is now an author and has a bright future ahead of her. And if you remember, Prem uh, was the star of my little video this morning, back in your beatboxing days. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about where you are today, other than attending many of the sessions. I hardly saw you today because he was here to get an education and took full advantage of it. So where, where are you today in life? Well, first of all, I have to uh, Thank you all for allowing me to uh, represent our school. And um, so um, today was actually a very great day. And as Ravi said, I was very busy, but trust me, I was not. I was just uh, trying to sit in all the sessions, trying to learn as much as possible. Because for me, I just graduated from college, and uh, there's a lot to be learned. And so sitting in these sessions, I get to uh, view things from uh, from uh, your perspective, like from through manager's eyes, how do you get the best out of your employees? So this kind of elevates your level of thinking, of not just thinking about what, what's, what's your next step gonna be. It's like, how far can you think? Like, so that's basically my point. And then uh, secondly, um, I'd like to say that, uh, first of all, Shanti Bhavan is, is more than just a place where you just get a regular education, because it has few uh, signature elements. Besides education, it has something where you develop your values, leadership, different virtues. So ha because Dr. George, our founder, as he always says, it's very important to have an opinion. And so this kind of brings out like the leadership roles and things that do not just talk about education. So this is, this is a family where you work as a community. And basically, it, it's, just like, it's just like how you work in your offices. You, you have certain people to work with. But in Chandiban, it's just like on, on a slightly bigger scale. You know everybody, you know everyone's strengths, their weaknesses, what you're good at. And then you, you kind of help each other to grow, learn. And not, obviously not just in academics, but through art, through like the singing, through dancing, you know, through plays, through skits, whatever it may be, sports. So this is a place that if any child given the opportunity to get into Shanti Bhavan, they can excel and they can be the change that they really want to make. Yeah, they really can excel. And again, the model is, um, the, the goal is really to eradicate poverty. Education is the process in order to do that. But the bigger goal is to eradicate poverty. And in order to do that, it's to break the cycle of poverty. And that's extremely important. So one of the things that the school does, which I think creates some challenges, is only one child per family in order to try to spread this as much as possible through the village. So that must be difficult, day one at Shanti Bhavan, uh, leaving your family, going into this, what is a beautiful campus designed to inspire the students to stay in beautiful environments. Uh, you know, very high quality, really trying to keep the bar high. But what was it like that first day? when you are essentially leaving your family, you are the chosen one of your family to come to this institution, and it is opportunity, it is sacrifice, it is all, you tell me, what is it? What was it like that first day, and what, uh, 
how did you and your family deal with it? Um, I talk I talk at length about uh, the first day at Shanti Bhavan in my book, but I'd like to say it in my own words to you today. Uh, looking, um, I have very distinct memories of that time. Um, I. My fam, my entire village. We, uh, everybody in my village, including members of my family, indulged. Their main occupation was that of uh, making homemade illicit liquor. So, uh, my father and his and his father would go out into the woods and brew the liquor and then sell it at night because it's an illegal trade. So they had to work at night when the police wouldn't be on their rounds looking out to catch men like them. And so my father's life was always one of running away from the police and one of uh, dire survival. And for a man like him who had never been educated, for when Dr. George, he actually happens to be in the room here to, today, uh, when he sent his team of people to go into these villages, both in the state of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh too. So we had a team of uh, the, the prince consisting of the principal, the psychologists, and the social workers who were going into the uh, regional villages looking for children to bring to the school. Children who were of the age of three and a half and four, children who came from very poor families and whose parents didn't have the means to educate them. And uh, they, so they were going into these villages and probably luck I or I some I always wonder what was that force or how, what was that power that brought them to my village and why me so uh, they happened to come to my village and I uh, I the I passed all the screening tests the small screening tests that they had and when it was time to let me go my parents had to make that decision my mother being just 17 at that time and I being her first child well, you, uh, I'm sure there are many mothers and fathers in this room too. You can put yourself in her shoes and you can imagine what it was like for her to be told that she had to give her child by her husband. Her husband was telling her to give her first child, her four-year-old daughter, to these perfect strangers who were promising to educate her child for free. And people like my family were not used to such generosity. Uh, leave alone from uh, the government or from the village heads. Nobody until them in their lives had ever come them and said, uh, come to them and said, "You give your child to me, and I do. Uh, I want nothing in return from you." That was just too hard for them to believe to be true. And why? And there was uh, no proof that these people were going to keep their word. There was there was nothing. They the school team had nothing to prove to people like my family that they were genuine in what they were promising and it was only natural for my mother to be extremely afraid and also the village there were rumors uh, spreading in the village that these people were going to take little children like us and harvest our kidneys and eyes so my mother and my entire family went berserk they said these people are uh, going to traffic the child or send them to America we had never heard of America so my parents were wondering what is that and um, Amidst all that turmoil, amidst my, this young woman having to make the most difficult decision in her life, my father forced her, he gave her no choice. He uh, made the sole decision. He uh, decided that I should be sent with the strangers and he told her, look, people who want to kidnap your child and have, take away their eyes or kidneys do not come in broad daylight. They come at night and they come into your house at night or uh, come in uh, scary looking vehicles and take your child. So just believe me. And she didn't. For years she never believed him but now she finally does because I don't have, I uh, not just have you both still have my, your eyes and your uh, kidneys. Yeah, my kidneys and my eyes <laughs> but I also have something more. I have my, an education, I have a voice of my own, today I have confidence. More than just being able to write and read, just uh, just being having these basic literary skills, I'm somebody who is not afraid to speak her mind. In my house now, I make the decisions for my parents. They look up to me, so I've been placed into this role. Initially, I felt I was pushed into this role of being a leader, but now I've accepted it, and I actually enjoy it, though it isn't very easy at times. 
So a lot has come along the way since my father made that decision to completely trust Dr. George and I'm very grateful that he did. And that happens at a young age. All the children are at, uh, uh, come to Shanti Bhavan at three and a half, four years old uh, because that's what it takes. We, uh, the school has to, for lack of a better word, acquire these children at that age in order to make real change. And it's pretty remarkable at the equivalent, the, the cost of four dollars a day for everything. The, the lives are being transformed. Families are being transformed. Villages are being transformed. And it's really something that has never happened before in one generation to be able to make such a transformation from uh, where they came from to, to where they are now. What was day one like for you? Okay, so before I talk about my first day at, at Shanti Bhavan, I'd just like to talk about, about my family. Yeah. So first of all, my father, um, he used to work as a helper in other people's homes. Like anything that was needed of him, like sweeping the house, cleaning the vessels, anything. And then my mom. Mom used to, like, my mom used to wash glasses to earn a living. So this is the status of my parents. And then luckily my father, he got a job to work in a factory, but still sweeping the factory. But then since he, he learned how, how to operate, operate the instruments, he kind of learned how to you know, work and then he got, he got a job offer. And then fortunately, one of my seniors who was admitted in Shanti Bhavan, his father worked in the same factory as my father did. So this is how I got connected to Shanti Bhavan. So talk about my first day. Obviously, I didn't know what my first day was going to be like. As a kid, I just wanted to run back to, into my arms of my family because I had no idea what Shanti Bhavan held, for, held. Because the value in this school cannot be understood when you're first admitted. Only after, only after experiencing will you know the true value. So my first day, I mean, I can't remember much except the fact that I've been hitting the doors trying to run back to my family. But besides that, all I remember is like running around, playing with friends, learning, just growing, just forgetting about all the problems at home and just making the most of the school. Powerful stories. Uh, there's 300 students at Shanti Bhavan at, at any given time. 300 powerful stories. Lives being changed like that. 12 boys, 12 girls uh, admitted every year on a basis. And uh, it's, really, it's really remarkable stories like that. And it's a very holistic model. I mean, every aspect of their lives are, t are taken into account from uh, making sure that they're in a safe environment, an environment that promotes, as Prem was saying, really good, strong values. Um, what is, say, after you had been in Shanti, now you, you graduated in 2011, and the first graduation class was 2009, so 2010. So, that was interesting too because now thinking about uh, trying to convince your parents there was no track record at that time of what's going on so now after many more years now there's evidence of what can be produced by a school like Shanti Bhavan so now flash forward maybe five years or, or even once you entered your high school years maybe what was a day what, what's the average day like in Shanti Bhavan you've got volunteers from all over the world so this global influence you have a wonderful uh, permanent faculty there and all these people that are there to for you to take care of you so what is what is a day like so our typical day is like we wake up at like six o'clock in the morning and yeah, then, I, rem I remember that part yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then so the younger kids obviously they go for pt they go play whatever sport they're interested in and then the older kids, like sixth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade up, we go, we go to our classrooms, do our homework. It's important. Then we go have a breakfast at seven, seven thirty, eight o'clock, and then we come back to class at eight thirty. Then we have regular classes. 
and then we have little breaks in between to have our snacks and then it this this continues to like 4:30 basic ed, basic education but then after 4:30 again you go uh, you go back to play if, if you want then you you have more time to um, do your homework but besides that um, we we have the chance like um, go to, go for choir practice go for dance classes go for go for you know skits theaters because we have volunteers from all around the world that come to sb so like basically share their experiences and basically help out in any way they want and we as kids obviously we'd be excited to talk to people from around the world and so this is a time where we get to interact with them and basically um, get to learn as much from them as we can in the time that we have um, there's one thing that's not changed from my first day in Shantaban to the time I, I left and continues even today. Um, all my mornings, ev my every day began with me waking up to the sound of music. Uh, that's one thing that we c c follow in Shantiban because um, in the auntie turns on the radio, we listen to classical music and initially we complained to her. We said we feel like going back to sleep when we listen to that music. The kids wanted um, the American top 40s, so, but, she's, but they were insistent. They said no, uh, this classical music is very good for your brain. So we just, we couldn't win that battle with her so we gave up and we continued listening to it. And now, and so each morning began like that. And um, until you reach the third or fourth grade, you need a lot of help from the aunties. We call them the aunties. They're actually the caretakers, the residential caretakers who live on campus. They do not go back home at night. They live, they reside on campus. And these are young women who play the role of substitute mothers. They, they are in, our, in the place of our mothers. Our mothers left us there at the age of four and left us entirely in the care of these people who uh, look after our needs from our basic needs from providing us food to clothing and a, a great shelter to live in and then we have our teachers who are with us from 8 30 in the morning to 10 at night for the older children they uh, for six, grade six and above we have prep we call that for sh in short we call it prep it's, it's actually preparation class where we do our homework like any other school child we uh, spend time after dinner to doing our homework and preparing for the next day so uh, we leave the dorm everything is on the same campus so we leave our dorm after breakfast at 8 30 the rest of the day we are in class we're in school we the entire school gathers at 11 o'clock in the main assembly hall for the school assembly so what does the school assembly consist of we have a brief prayer we uh, address a a universal God. We do not utter the names of a particular God of any religion. We say we address God as dear God and we, because the entire mission of the school or a part of its mission is to raise children with the ethos of uh, equality, respect for differences in religion, caste, though we do not believe in such a thing as caste despite the fact that many uh, children do hail from uh, the Dalit or the scheduled caste. But growing up, Prem and I, we were never told, we were never reminded that you belong to this caste. So we never had to have those conversations between us. But um, Dr. George, who plays the role of not just the founder, his creating something doesn't stop. Being the founder doesn't stop with just having built and created something. It goes on to carrying that institution or mission forward and uh, gathering other people to support your mission. And he created a wonderful team of these uh, aunties and staff uh, and teachers. And then we had volunteers like Ravi who came from all around the world and who continue to do so. Just day before yesterday, we had a team of uh, artists from an organization called A-STEP, which stands for Artists Striving to End Poverty. They uh, spend, they come to Shantiban twice a year for two, a fortnight each, and they bring with them their talents in music and art. And so my school life consisted of continuously having uh, to ask questions because I loved asking questions. There was never a moment when I didn't have a question because when you're just done with reading something from the textbook, then you have a volunteer who's standing before you and you want to ask them about their country, about the kind of food that they eat or why they name, why most of them have the name Jack and why are names there so, the, why are names not in uh, from where they come from? Why do people don't, ha why don't they have 
diverse names like we do in India. And so we always were asking questions and I look back very fondly at my childhood and probably that was one reason why I wanted to pursue journalism because I loved asking questions. But uh, now I've switched to psychology. Ah, okay. Well, as a psychologist, you get to ask a lot of questions too. So you're, <clears throat> that was very agile, wasn't it? A way to pivot there. Um, you know what's amazing is that 97% of the children graduate uh, from high school and all of the high school graduates are accepted into top universities across India. And 98% of those graduate college. And again, remember where they come from. It's a, those are some incredible percentages. But what was interesting about what you just said is you have these aunties who are taking care of you. You have volunteers from all over the world. So they are not aware of, of their own caste, if you will. And, and you're also not really aware of racism and many of those issues that exist in the real world because you've grown up in this very global environment within your school. So now with such a high percentage that now we, Shanti Bhavan pays for your college, but your college is out in the real world. That is quite a transition to make because now you have to deal with the realities of corruption, of uh, prejudice, and things that you weren't used to. So what was that like? They, when you go into college and now have to face some of these realities that you've been protected from all this time? Well, so college is obviously um, a very different part of your life. So in SB, um, our, everything is usually, you know, um, scheduled out for us. Like we know what time to wake up, what time to do this, what time to do that. But, but when you come out to college, it's something completely different. You have to stand up for yourself. You have to come up with, you have to be, you have to, uh, you have to do things, you have to make up your mind, you have to do this at this, at this time of the day, and you have to follow through the whole day and not slack off. Because if you do, it, it kind of builds on and then by the end of like a month or two, you're probably lay, like sleeping at home and not attending college, which is a very bad thing. So that's, um, so in college, so this is one thing that was slightly different. I had to take care of myself, which, which was not a big problem because in, S in Shanti Bhavan, uh, we, were, we were taught to like stand up for self, like do things, like make up your mind and follow through. And then um, another challenge in college is for like meeting new people. Because in Shanti Bhavan, you know everybody and everybody knows you. And then once you come out to college, you, you meet different people from different parts of the state or whatever. And everybody has different personalities. So initially when you go to college, you feel really alone. And then you, you, want to, you want to make friends, but then making friends is not very important because if, if, you, if you stay true to who you really are, people will come to you. People will, will come to you based on your character. So, so it, it's, not, it's not really a challenge, but in the, in, in the first few days, it was, I felt really alone because I didn't know who to talk to, who to share my experiences with. But then as the days went by, it, it kind of, it, it solved itself. And then that's pretty much it. And Shilpa, do you want to answer that? Um, so the first huge transformation that took place in our lives was when we left home at the age of four to join Shanti Bhavan. And then after 14 years, we were leaving school to come into the real world, to join college. And most so, both those huge transformational phases were filled with uh, mixed emotions. We were very excited. In fact, when we were growing up, uh, Prem must, uh, might remember, we used to uh, say, I'm waiting to leave Shantipur to go to college. But when the moment came for us to leave, we were so scared. We had, since we had never been outside Shantipur other than the brief uh, periods we would go home. So the staff had this uh, colossal task of having to prepare us for life outside the gates of Shanti Bhavan. Um, they, so what, were, what, did those, uh, what did that task consist of? They had to prepare us, for, uh, to with, train us to have good time management skills. And we had never managed money before. So even though it was a small sum, it was just a, a little pocket money, but we had never managed or had money before. So now we were uh, having to manage 500 rupees a month. So that was our pocket money. And then how do we select friends? 
in college how do we know who are the friends who will be good who will be who will have the right influence on us and who are the ones who are going to always throw uh, temptations at you and so and then things like more serious things like how to avoid getting into a relationship that's not very healthy and apart from that how now that you, they, we were away from the direct guidance of the staff the, uh, how do we continue to stay in touch with shanti bhavan and how and how do we also manage the fact that we are more in we are in closer touch with our families growing up our contact with our families was uh, limited but now once we graduated from shanti bhavan we were more in frequent touch with we were frequently in touch with our families over the phone or we would visit them over the weekend so we had all these temptations around us and how so the staff um, we had a team placed in college to in bangalore we have a team that was given the task of monitoring the progress of the college kids because the school has brought you so far they brought you till 12th grade and now they're sending you into college and they don't want to lose you to the temptations that are out there and that temptations that any young person would fall for so um i'm now looking back uh, i can say that i really enjoyed my college years because i like the fact that while i did have a lot of freedom i didn't um i could um i didn't have people constantly checking everything that i was doing but so that was scary at first because i was so used to somebody always looking after me and i realized that with freedom comes responsibility so keeping that in mind i was able to manage my days out of shanti bhavan you know what's what's remarkable too is that um 97% of the children go on to work for full time multinational companies like amazon deloitte ernest and young goldman sachs i mean it's an incredible list of fortune 500 companies that these children end up working uh at and probably leading one day there's no reason to think that they won't they're perfectly capable of leading these amazing companies but i think many parents and this this ranges from culture to culture uh there's sort of a philosophy the poet uh, jibran talks about uh the bow and the arrow the child is the arrow the parent is the bow and the parent pulls that bow and the arrow flies onto their own life but shanti bhavan has a slightly different view point of that because it really has a bigger goal in mind which is to eradicate poverty so with all of this uh generosity comes some responsibility as well and so i believe many of the graduates all of the graduates are still involved in the school uh as mentors as teachers but also uh you're involved in your villages and part of the money that you earn goes to rebuilding homes and goes to infrastructure in the villages and helping the families which helps everyone in these situations learn the value of an education um so talk a little bit about that once you once you've had this amazing experience and you've graduated college and the world is there you have this responsibility as well so how do you feel about that how does how do you work that into now your busy lives well so um as ravi said it's important that uh, we give back a little bit so um so when we when we uh, move from school days to college uh, as ravi mentioned we there's a mentorship program where some of the graduates meaning graduated from shanti bhavan when they go to college they come back on the weekends and uh, interact with the students like they can help in additional tests little some uh, exams and then also share experiences of what they've learned in college so that the students are more prepared when they come out to college and and besides mentoring there's uh, like before like every year b- before the the highest batch graduates from shanti bhavan we have panel sessions where it's mainly dedicated to helping them focus when when they're trying to make the transition from going from school days into uh, in the college life so in those kind of panel sessions which are which have been a part of we may we majorly cover topics such as time management having proper relationships and many other various topics that they, they that they will have to come across when they move on to college so this is one way that we participate in uh, we give back to shantan once we uh, come to college oh, okay and um, my family obviously um 
See, I am very fortunate that I've been given this opportunity, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't help out like my cousins or people living around me. So what I do is like whenever I have the time, like after college, so I go to my cousin's house and then I teach them like basic things, how how bet how to study better because mm, some of the education systems in in these in the schools are not very good. So I give them tips on how to how to study better, how to like take notes and try to underline important points in textbooks and like basically simple things that they can use on a daily basis so that they can improve their uh, you know their studying study study ways and basic just better off than they than they would be and um, yes and family uh, see uh, something important is I, I I have to communicate I have to talk to my parents telling that telling them that there's a bigger objective because sometimes um, some, uh, sometimes it's our parents feel like uh, they made a wrong decision sending us to Shanti Bhavan, but then it's our responsibility to make them understand that this could mean something a lot bigger, because they don't they don't know what's out there. All because our family they're just concerned about getting money and just living on day to day basis. But whereas what we've been taught is something a lot bigger. How do you achieve things that? our parents wouldn't wouldn't even have thought about so we have to try, try to create this sort of balance telling that uh, telling our parents like save a little money so we can you know we can uh, study for, for, for further education and then basic things like this so oh, keeping the communications line communication lines between our our parents is very important and yeah, that's and my family had waited from uh, waited for me to finish 12th grade so that i could start earning so that it was almost 14 years of them waiting for me to start earning and then i shocked them by saying that i want to go to college and both my parents have never been to college and so uh, i was again asking them to wait and when the time did come for me to go to college, I gave them another rude shock. I said I wanted to stay back in Shantpan for a year to work on my book. And for them, uh, nobody in my village has ever had a dream of writing a book and they didn't understand what it entails. It entails a lot of hours of working and uh, working hard and giving up uh, and not doing things that your family wants you to. And that is to make immediate money. And then when I finally finished my undergrad, I studied for three years at uh, Jyoti Nivas. I did my uh, bachelor's in psychology and English education. Uh, in, I did English, uh, optional English, English literature. I decided to do two more years uh, to pursue my master's in psychology. So I've put them, given them such a, made them wait for so many years. And they've been, uh, and, but finally the time has come. I've started working. I work uh, part-time as a counselor at Spastic Society of Karnataka. And the rest of the time I teach at Shanti Bhavan and I've finally started earning. And every month I send money to pay off debts. Uh, my mother happened to be very sick a few months ago and we had taken a lot of, we had taken a huge loan to pay for her hospital bills. So every month I don't give the money directly to my parents because I know that by doing that the money will disappear very quickly. What I do is directly pay the person who I borrowed the money from. Mm -hmm. So these are things that uh, you learn along the way. There's all, you, though your parents might get hurt that you're not giving them your first salary in their hand you realize that it's not the smartest thing to do and the best the smartest thing is to pay directly rather than give them the money and your father goes and spends it on drinks so i've i'm really happy that i finally um, started helping my family in a small way so shilpa sends me a text message a couple of hours ago and says uh, ravi would would you mind if if dr george comes this afternoon I said, would I mind? That would be wonderful if, uh, if he would join us. And so the founder of Shanti Bhavan, my friend Abraham George. Mm -hmm. <laughs> join us. So I was giving a, a talk at Columbia University in 1999 and this gentleman comes up to me afterwards and he says, uh, you know, I started a school two years ago 
in India. You must come and visit. You must come and see it. You remember this? Uh, and uh, I, I was interested, I was intrigued, but I wasn't very proactive about it. But for 10 years, I kept hearing about this school. And then Abraham sent me the pictures of the first graduation. And that year, I had to get on an airplane and come and, and see what he had created and witness what really is transformation. And it is, it is absolutely remarkable. And, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about what inspired you to create this opportunity for these kids. Thank you, Ravi, for asking me to come. Uh, I, I just want to remind you that uh, uh, you may not have been in Chandibhavan for the last seven years, but you kept in touch with me constantly. And he was always there wanting to be helpful uh, to the work that we were doing. So for all that, we are uh, very grateful to you, uh, Ravi. And um, I couldn't ask for more in life than beautiful children like these two. So I feel that uh, um, uh, once you get started, the inspiration comes automatically from seeing them grow. Um, but then, if I, if I had to answer your question, uh, what inspired me, probably it goes back to my young days. Uh, uh, when I was barely 19, I was in the Army, Indian Army. I was an artillery officer, product of NDA, Kadakwasla, and all that, and I was posted on the Chinese border. Uh, in the 1960s. I'm pretty ancient, by the way. I'm not too young like you. Uh, um, I was there during the, soon after the Chinese invasion of India. And I was posted, I was posted at 14,000 feet above sea level. I don't know whether you've heard of a, a pass through which the Chinese army invaded India called Sela Pass. Uh, I sell a pass is at 14,000 feet above sea level, very, very cold, minus degrees and uh, shortage of oxygen and everything else. And uh, sitting there on top of the world, the clouds were below me, sitting there on the top of the world and uh, no one to talk to other than the winds that come whistling through the valleys, you know, and the sun sets by three o'clock in the afternoon. And sitting there, I was thinking about what I want to do with my life. And I came to the conclusion that, that the best thing I could do was somehow find a way uh, to serve other people. Uh, well, that thought came actually even before that, um, traveling around India, northern part of India and so on, and seeing poverty and discrimination and so on. And I was affected by it. Um, and now, having made a decision, um, I was thinking about what I should be, uh, how I should be preparing myself. And that's when I ran into the book, um, or I read the book by, uh, on Albert Schweitzer, uh, the German doctor who went to Gabon, Equatorial Africa, and started his hospital in no man's land, uh, looking after the the, the, the natives, uh, the villagers, uh, the African uh, in the forest. And it was very romantic. Uh, you know, can, you can imagine, right? Going into some African village in no man's land in the midst of forest and doing wonderful things by yourself and pretty soon people come. And he won a Nobel Prize, by the way. And, uh, and so it, I felt it was the best thing uh, any person could do. So I left the army, went to America. I had a chance to go to America, did my studies and so on, and I had my business. And uh, all along, I had only one goal, and that was somehow I have to make a lot of money and, uh, uh, and start my work. Uh, in Shant you know, the idea of Shanti uh, wa was conceived actually not uh, uh, from the idea of eradicating poverty, but I was very affected by the social injustice behind the caste system. And having now spent 50 years in America and, you know, last 22 years in the rural village where we do our work, going and traveling up and down, actually this Sunday I'm leaving back for America and then I come back. I spent seven months in a year in India in the village. I live with the children. Um, and my wife is in America and we share. So the inspiration came from the children, actually, seeing them grow and how beautiful uh, they are, 
And what I want to leave uh, with you is the thought that each one of us can make a difference uh, in our own way. Um, of course, if you have a lot of money, you can do bigger things, I suppose. But even um, without much money, you can do still do big things. And and the the thought that uh, we have a human uh, duty, a duty to serve others, uh, people who are at the mercy of life, uh, who are suffering, uh, who don't have the same means as we have. We are fortunate. Um, and how can we reach out to them? And if you are driven by that, you will find your answer. You will find a way to be helpful. You can find solutions in your own way. It doesn't have to be all with money. And uh, the net result, the result of your work will be children like them and 300 others and actually 400 because there are 100 who have gone to work, uh, 50 who have gone to work and another 50 in colleges. So um, it's a beautiful thing. Every year another bunch of kids come along and see them grow. Uh, and there's nothing more rewarding than uh, the fact that uh, they are better than me. They'll one day do better things than me. And that's what's so wonderful, too, is we think about how one person can change the... <laughs> how one person can change the world, but by doing what you have done, you're creating 300 people that can change the world. So it has exponential effect when you create a model that creates leaders. I, I want to correct one thing. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, it is not all my effort now. There are so many people involved, and there are a lot of contributors. There are donors all over the world. Uh, so the first 12 years, uh, it was from what I had earned, but today it is mostly from donors all over the world, including in India and abroad. So I don't want to take all the credit that I'm doing everything. I may be here uh, doing the work, but others are helping to make it a reality. And, and it is the uh, con contributions of others and the collaboration of many people that are now bringing us to this next phase, which is the opportunity to build Shanti Bhavan 2. Yes. There is a gala in uh, New York uh, where we are inviting corporations, maybe Accenture might be invited to, to come uh, and to help build another Shanti Bhavan in another part of India, South India, or North India, I don't know. Um, and, uh, and companies sponsoring this building or that building or this, uh, uh, part of the the effort uh, together we can do it. India is a rich country. Yeah, at least there is um, enough wealth among uh, a, a certain segment of the population. We can create 1,000 Shanti Bhavan, not just one. And if we do that, just imagine you create young people like this with a fire in the belly who will go out and make a difference, who will carry with the 100 others with them. Imagine having 1,000 schools We'll break the caste system. We will have higher productivity in our nation. We will have people with moral authority. There are so many wonderful things that will come out of it. And that should be our dream. Yeah. So remember, you can learn a lot more about uh, Shanti Bhavan at uh, shantibhavanonline.com. And also, uh, this morning after my keynote, uh, I had mentioned to you that you should sign up uh, on my list to get a copy of the PowerPoint, but there's a little check mark there that says send me more information on Shanti Bhavan as well. So if you click that, there's a lot of information that I will send you about how you can learn more about the school and how you can get involved and how you can help achieve much more of this on a grander scale and really change India and change the world at the same time. So we have to wrap things up, but I was wondering if we could close with Shilpa reading a passage from her book. Would you do us that honor? I'd love to. And uh, I just want to add one point. One, the mission of Shantipan is not just to bring children out of poverty. 
it has the theme of the multiplicative effect. Dr. George believed that one Prem or one Shilpa can carry a hundred more forward with him or her. So while we are at the stage, right now we are in the stage at our lives where we are helping our immediate families um, and once we achieve that, both of us have the duty to look outside our families and reach out to the community at large and go where there is a need and be not just restrict ourselves to our families or the country that we were born in but to go out anywhere in the world where there is a need and uh, upon that theme I just want to read a passage that talks about the real um, essence of Shanti Bhavan and what it means to me and what it means to each one of us who have been through this beautiful program through the eyes of Dr. George. He paused, he paused for a moment that he is Dr. George. Many people told me children from poor homes could not succeed academically even if they studied in good schools. They said that nurture was more powerful than nurture. You have proved them wrong. I am a very proud man today because of you. He struggled to overcome the tears welling in his eyes. It is not about the beautiful setting of Shanti Bhavan, its buildings and gardens. It is not about the people who work here. It is not about me and it is not even about you. It is about all those combined and what we accomplish together, how lives are transformed how families are taken care of and what you will do for others in the ideals of equality, truth, generosity, compassion and ultimately in reverence for life. So reverence for life, the care, the respect and the love for the life of another is something that was instilled in us from a very young age and that's one of the uh, greatest principles that Prem and I live our lives by. So this, this is the future, and this is Shanti Bhavan. Thank you.